Hello everyone, my name is Ruhi Sahu and I'm a student at The Ohio State University. Today, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Lauren Powell to lead a session discussing racism in healthcare and health equity. Recently named among Fortune's 40 under 40 in healthcare, Dr. Lauren Powell is the president and CEO of The Equitist. As a founding leader of The Equitist, she helps systems and leaders move from embracing health equity in theory to action by noticing and intervening in oppressive forces that operate within, within people and systems. Her professional and personal experiences spearheading equity efforts in healthcare make her a nationally sought leader on all things health equity. Attendees, feel free to put your questions in the chat, or sorry, in the Q&A section throughout the presentation. And please welcome Dr. Lauren Powell. Well, thank you, Ruhi, for that lovely introduction. And good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, hello to you, and thanks for the opportunity to participate in today's uh, really great conference lineup. I'm going to share my screen so we can get to my presentation. Gosh, Google Slides always messes me up. OK. Um, so this morning, we're going to talk about a legacy of racism, race-based treatment in healthcare. My name is Dr. Lauren Powell. Um, I invite you to follow me on Twitter or on LinkedIn if you are on either of those platforms. Um, and today, we're going to talk about really the, um, the history that has really led to um, what we see today is, is racial health inequities and the history behind that. So I first want to start with um, to, to start with understanding the history here, we really have to go all the way back to uh, to the bottom of the map. We have to go all the way back to um, the beginning of um, Africans in this country. That was 1619 when the first enslaved um, Africans arrived in America um, in what would come to be known as Virginia. So, Slavery was an openly accepted um, commodification of bodies um, from 1619 until like technically until 1864-ish, 1863. But in 1807, something really important and interesting happened. Um, there was an act that was passed that specifically prohibited the importation of slaves. Now, prior to this, um, African bodies and African people were moved from across the continent and were part of the transatlantic slave trade, which I'm sure you all have heard about, which was transporting slaves from um, Africa and, and other West Indian um, countries to other European countries, right? So this act in 1807 though said that technically you could no longer import slaves. Like, First, let me just ground you in the fact that we're we're talking about people. So we're talking about humans um, that were essentially trafficked and moved around as commodities. So that's the first thing to think about. But the second is that the importance of this act meant that slave owners had to actually take really good care of the people that they that were within their jurisdiction. So they could no longer say if um, a, a slave got injured or grew older or was just like not malnourished or not taken care of, they couldn't just trade it out for, for another uh, body. So this was a very important act that led to um, a, a, an invested interest in slave owners making sure that they took care of their slaves. And that is actually the foundation of what would become our healthcare system. So I'm gonna fast forward just a little bit because in that moment, then there was an invested interest, as I said, in um, slave owners recognizing the importance of taking care of, of their slaves. That meant that women became extremely important in making sure that they could actually procreate, which is where we get um, the uh, several of the procedures we still use in obstetrics and gynecology, which I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. But it also, all of that in, in the commodification of Black bodies, right, really created the foundation of what we would come to know as eugenics and scientific racism. That was um, the idea that there was an inferiority in uh, certain races 
based against the superiority of the white race. And that, that uh, the goal was to ensure that, um, that those races would not necessarily procreate um, and that there were specific standards that would show you the difference between um, the value in those different races. And so, sorry, wrong way. And so some e examples of that, um, eugenics really, really projected the idea that some people were born to be a burden on the rest and that there were certain groups of people in society that were less important and, and um, less able-bodied than others. Oh gosh, why does that keep happening? And so what we see here is an example of eugenics. Um, so taking, for example, um, the shape of someone's nose, the size of someone's nose, the, the size of, of someone's head or uh, cranial size was used to determine superiority and inferiority. Um, really, really important foundational notions of what would become scientific racism, but that would also bleed over into the ways that we treat um, different people when they seek healthcare today. We can fast forward, I'm, I'm taking you through some vignettes, so we can also fast forward into modern medicine in the history of experimenting on black bodies and how that um, has continued to have an impact even in the more modern centuries. I hope that you all know who this woman is. This is Henrietta Lacks. Um, Henrietta Lacks is um, an African-American woman who's really credited as being the modern matriarch of medicine. She uh, her cells were actually taken from her um, when she was seeking health care several years ago. Um, she was seeking care for um, cancer. She had cervical cancer and her cells were actually extracted, um, which was a common practice during that period of time. But um, her cells were extracted for the use of, of science, right? But with people didn't realize is that her cells would go on to become the first line of immoral um, human cells. And they are actually still alive today. October will mark the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the HeLa cells, which you may have used in, um, in laboratories or in lab experiments if you are, have been a bench scientist. Um, if you've used HeLa cells, they are credited to a black woman, Henrietta Lacks. Um, her cells are still, still alive today, um, but the resurfacing of this story, um, which happened maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, the resurfacing of the story and really attributing um, HeLa cells to Henrietta Lacks has very much sparked um, a remembrance in the black community of the many ways that black bodies have been exploited for experimentation purposes and to build the foundation of our healthcare system. So a couple of these um, instances and a couple of these um, illustrations here I've already mentioned. We're gonna start in the top, um, my left corner, so maybe your right corner, but here where we see the woman who is sitting on the table. Um, this is a um, illustration, if you will, of um, the ways that, that black women became so um, such an important foundation of, of the healthcare system, mostly against their will. This is um, an illustration that really speaks to J. Marion Sims, who some of you may be familiar with. He is heralded as the modern father of gynecology, um, but it is said that he created many of the procedures that we still use today in obstetrics and gynecology, but he created those on using um, Black women. So remember when I said um, the Importation Act, the act that prohibited importation of slaves in like 1807, that that gave slave owners an, an important incentive and reason to maintain um, the, the population of people that they already had and to make sure that women in particular were able to bear more children and were kept healthy and well in order to do so. This is a direct example of how that built our healthcare system. So J. Marion Sims is heralded as the father of gynecology he is accredited with so many um, different procedures that are still used today in modern obstetrics and gynecology. But it is said that he discovered those procedures, if you will, by experimenting on 
uh, several black women, several African women uh, who were slaves. And it's said that he did his procedures on them without the use of anesthesia. So um, one example in, in one prolific uh, woman that it is said he experimented on over 40 times without the use of anesthesia. So I want you to think about what that means or the foundation of what of, of how healthcare came to be in the United States in particular, um, but with also with global implications that um, one, several of the procedures and in, in some of the um, advances that we have today, many of the advances that we have today were built on um, black bodies. Second, that understand that these experiments were done with, with no anesthesia. So there was already an ingrained thought that somehow Black people, that somehow slaves and people of African ancestry did not feel pain or could tolerate pain in a very different way. Um, remember that because we're going to come back to that and I'm going to show you some modern day examples of how that still remains a problem in healthcare. Um, the next picture we see is just examples, a couple of them actually, of um, the ways that Black bodies were actually experimented on um, in the use of. Um, anatomy and physiology in, in medical schools, right? So you're all probably very familiar as your pre-health students with some of the requirements for um, medical school and for other professional, um, healthcare professional training is, is anatomy and physiology. And so now there are very strict standards on, on how specimen and, um, and, and individuals might donate their bodies to that. But long before those policies were in place, um, there were um, very often frequent circumstances of uh, grave robbing where medical schools, uh, Medical College of Virginia, Medical College of Georgia, there's um, a history in several of our medical schools and um, training grounds that there was a, a habit, um, unfortunate habit of robbing graves, specifically of Black cemeteries. So of course, segregation and um, the separation of society was still very prolific at this point. And there were uh, white cemeteries and there were black cemeteries and the black cemeteries would often be robbed and um, bodies from those cemeteries would be taken to medical colleges and medical universities, <clears throat> excuse me, and would be used for anatomy and physiology. And so you see that there's ongoing um, a constant betrayal, if you will, um, in the Black community in particular, and the Black community is not the only one, um, in which somehow um, this group of people constantly became kind of the, the foundation for um, our healthcare, our healthcare system, and many of the procedures and lots of the learning that has happened over the years, many of the medical breakthroughs have been at the expense of the use of Black bodies. And the last picture here is one you may have seen before, and if you haven't, I encourage you to learn much more about it. Um, it's referring to the um, study of untreated syphilis in Black men at Tuskegee University. Now, this is often pointed to most frequently as being the, the biggest example of, of the lack of trust that many African-Americans still have in the medical system. Um, what happened in this study is that um, there were a cohort of Black men in Tuskegee, um, Alabama, who were... Um, not necessarily who were who were monitored essentially for their exposure to um, to syphilis. Now, when a um, treatment was actually penicillin was actually discovered, like a period into this um, observational study, which is really what it was, um, that treatment was not offered to these men. And so, syphilis is uh, can be deadly. Syphilis can cause blindness, and congenital defects, and, and lots of different challenges. And these men were just um, kind of followed and watched the monitor, but there was never an intervention to provide them with um, care that we actually know would have saved them. And just for some context, I mean, this went on for 40 years. Um, it was not until the, the 90s that then President Bill Clinton actually apologized to the last living um, men of the, of the, the to syphilis study at Tuskegee University. He actually um, rendered them an apology on behalf of the United States. And this was also um, a study that was carried out by the United States Public Health Service Corps. So this was carried out by the government. Um, and this by and large really is a, is a very big illustration um, that's compounded by all of these other examples I've given you, which by the way, are only one of a few 
of a few hundreds, if not thousands of examples of the ways that um, healthcare, the healthcare system has not always been welcoming to people of color. If we fast forward a little bit more to the early 2000s, um, we have very concrete evidence of the ways that racism still continues to play a role in um, healthcare outcomes. In 2003, the then Institutes of Medicine, now the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and, and Math, I think, um, commissioned, Congress commissioned a study to um, really look at health disparities and health inequities. That created um, this really um, deep expose, if you will, called Unequal Treatments Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare, which basically elevated the fact that racial disparities um, exist and, and health disparities exist because of racism, that there are documented examples of how um, African-Americans who presented with diabetes were off offered amputation more often and unnecessarily as opposed to their white counterparts, how um, so many other chronic conditions go um, under, under treated in African-Americans that when we control for um, all of these other variables, socioeconomic status, education, um, and so many other variables that we still find that there's a difference in health outcomes, which tells us that it has to do with racism. It not only has to do with racism, but it also has to deal with, with mistrust. And mistrust is, is really not just about what happened 40 plus years ago. And, and let me um, remind you that, you know, again, most of the, um, when we talk about, for example, like the lack of confidence in the vaccine and vaccination, COVID vaccination, a lot of the points and examples that people point to are from um, the untreated, the study of untreated syphilis at Tuskegee University, right? And that was 40 plus years ago. But we don't have to look that far into the past to see examples of how racism continues to play out today and in healthcare and how that engenders con uh, a consistent kind of narrative in, in um, not even narrative, a, a consistent need, a reason for mistrust in uh, certain communities. So I pulled just a couple of examples and these were actually from several, a couple of months ago, but um, example of a man who, who died in a parking lot after the hospital refused to treat him. Um, how COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact on black men, on young black men. Um, and how uh, racial data around COVID vaccines um, really did not include Native Americans for uh, a, a very long period of time. And so mistrust, it, again, it's not just about what happened 40 plus years ago. We don't have to look that far into the past. We can look at the ways that um, African Americans and people of color have to navigate society today to see that the um, lack of trust that um, is in other social systems also has an impact on how people view the healthcare system. But I actually think there's an opportunity for us and you all as, as pre-health um, students and with an interest in making a significant impact on health outcomes and healthcare, there's an opportunity here for us to shift our focus from mistrust to trustworthiness. Mistrust really is about um, suspicion. It's, it's when you have, you don't have confidence in something and mistrust to me is a very, um, it, it is a very individualistic perspective on something. So to me, when we say that um, Black Americans are, or African Americans have mistrust in the healthcare system. To me, that says that it is somehow on this group of people who has been wronged and exploited for so many hundreds of years to find a way to trust a system that has never, never really made themselves to be um, worthy of trust. Alternatively, I think we have the opportunity to shift our focus to trustworthiness. That is, how do we build um, healthcare systems, how do we build healthcare leaders who are worthy of our trust? That is, they have the ability to be relied on as honest or truthful. What would it look like if we had a healthcare system that was actually trustworthy and that was then worthy of, of the trust of a group of people, um, people of color, marginalized people 
who have been exploited and harmed by, um, by these systems previously. The, the impact of bias treatment in healthcare and the, in the mistrust, the lack of trust in the healthcare system has truly been debilitating and continues to be a challenge today. Um, we know that there is um, a disparity and in, in, in inequity really in um, why black men in America have worse health outcomes than white men. Um, and that ex extends to um, black women as well and women of color as well. We know that racial bias and pain assessment and treatment recommendations are still a problem and a challenge. Remember, when I went back and talked about J. Marion Sims and um, the ways that he experimented on his subjects without the use of anesthesia and that that set a precedence, right, for um, the fact that, that Black people do not, may not experience uh, a false belief that Black people may not experience pain the same way. We see very modern examples of that as as recent as um, 20, 2016, I believe, that a study, uh, this study actually, about racial bias and pain assessment and treatment recommendations that continue to underscore false beliefs about biological differences between Blacks and whites and really thinking somehow that Black people have thicker skin that somehow do, can tolerate pain more readily than white people and white patients. Um, and that medical mistrust racism um, also contributes to delays in preventative health screenings among African American men and women. So the impacts of bias treatment in healthcare, the impacts of racism, and a legacy of racism in healthcare continues to impact us even today, even in the midst of the global pandemic that we are all still navigating. One of the most um, challenging and, and heart wrenching, I think, examples of this um, was the case of Dr. Susan Moore. Again, if you are not familiar with this case, I would encourage you to Google it and read about it. Um, Dr. Susan Moore was a black woman. She was a, a doctor who died of COVID-19 after complaining of racist treatment, of, uh, of experiencing racism um, as an inpatient in the hospital. What happened is she actually filmed a message from her, what would then become unfortunately her deathbed, um, saying that she felt like um, the white male doctor who was uh, treating her um, was downplaying her complaints of pain. Remember the, the, the connections to pain that I have already kind of explained in several ways throughout this presentation, that he thought that she was downplaying her complaints of pain and uh, suggesting that she should be discharged. And um, he made her feel like a drug addict and so many other things that she uh, articulated in her video. The, the scary part, I think, for many in the Black community um, was to consider if a well-educated Black woman um, who's also a physician was treated in this way, what would the rest of us experience? What could the rest of us experience? Um, so again, the ways that a legacy of racism continue to have a real-time modern day impact on health outcomes. Dr. Susan Moore unfortunately passed away in December of 2020. I wanna remind you that this happens everywhere, not just in healthcare, that, um, that I'm sorry, I'm trying to move my comment out of the way. I'll get to your comments in just one second, that this happens everywhere, not just in healthcare. Um, and I want to remind you and very much center you on the fact that um, it is racism and not race that is the culprit here. Often um, and incorrectly, people associate race as being the problem. It's not, it's not the problem that we have uh, a, a lot of different um, types of races and ethnicities in this country. It's a problem that there is a system that classifies the way that those people should be treated um, and the value of those lives. And so I wanna just remind you that it is racism as a system, as a construct that is the problem here and not race. Finally, I wanna leave you on a, on a high note um, and give you some things to think about. I like to end with solutions, right? We know that racism, the legacy of racism is a problem in healthcare. Um, that you as the future leaders and, and future professionals of, um, of health and healthcare and public health and mental health and um, everything related to health and wellness, you have an opportunity to, to shift 
um, the history of what the system has been into something much better. How can we do that? I think you can do that through health equity. Health equity really requires us to wrestle with racism and systems of power and privilege. That means if we're not doing that, then we are not working on health equity. If, um, if we are uh, overlooking kind of the intrinsic powers of community, if we are um, not clear with ourselves about the ways that racism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, um, sexism, all of these other isms and um, forms of oppression are operating within um, our systems and also within society, and we are not actually working on health equity. Health equity, for your reference, is when all people and communities have the opportunity to attain their full potential and highest level of health. Very, very important note here. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, please remember that equality is not equity. Equality is not equity. What we see here is a graphic from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and by the way, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a, a very powerful entity in the public health and healthcare world. Uh, very big philanthropy, uh, philanthropic arm of healthcare that really um, focuses a lot on health equity. What we see in this graphic is on the top, we see equality. On the bottom, we see equity. Equality is giving everyone the same thing. So what we see is people on the top with differing needs getting the same thing, the same amount of resource, the allocated in the exact same way, regardless of the fact that their needs are different. And because they have differing needs but have all been given the same thing, they can't all take advantage of the resource that's been given. In fact, what we see is the person who is most privileged Actually, we only increase their privilege through the lens of equality because we're only adding, we're adding to the leg up that they already had. What we see on the bottom is equity though. That is people with differing needs getting exactly what they need. And because they're all getting the resource that they need in the way that they need it and the amount that they need it, um, they can all make use of the resource that's been given. Equality is not equity. If I put it to you another way, um, I happen to like shoes. If I put it to you another way, equality is giving everyone a pair of shoes, but equity is giving people shoes that fit. When we think about health equity, that is our goal. How do we make sure that we are allocating our resources, that we are tailoring our approaches, that we are meeting communities and individuals right where they are to ensure that they can all meet and attain their highest level of health and wellness. Um, and that we are giving them the resources that they need in the ways that they need it at the time that they need it, which will also mean that some communities will need more than others, right? That is equity. Equity is not equality. How can we, what can we do to stop racism in healthcare today? Racism has recently been declared a public health crisis um, that we have been navigating in this, in this era and in this moment, two deadly pandemics, right? COVID-19 and racism. So what can we actually do to stop racism in healthcare treatment? I'm glad you asked because you are the future. And so I hope that you will take note of this. Um, detection first, I think I can break it down into four Ds. One is detection. So leveraging data to highlight the problem. Now we have to be careful here though, because leveraging data means that we leverage it for the use of action, right? That means that we are smart and we are mindful about the ways that we are collecting data, about what data we're collecting, and ultimately we use it to power us into action so that we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel, we're, we're not constantly um, investigating a problem that we already know exists. We know that racism is a problem in healthcare treatment, that racism contributes to healthcare outcomes, that racism is a social determinant of health. We know that. So how do we leverage the data that we have now to highlight the problem, but then move us into action? It will take discipline. We have to have real accountability for healthcare leaders, leaders who um, are, are clearly found to have um, bias in, in the ways that they treat people that clearly are shown to be racist, that are clearly are, are shown to um, perpetuate um, the, the disparities and the inequities in the healthcare outcomes we continue to see. There must be discipline for that. 
disciplinary action. Um, Three, there has to be dedication. We have to dedicate time, resources, and people to combat this issue. Um, we're seeing a, an explosion of uh, leaders in health equity, uh, leaders in diversity, equity, and inclusion practically in every institution um, in the United States. I think that's wonderful. But the question is, do those leaders have the resources that they need to actually make sustainable change? So we have to be dedicated beyond this moment, which I hope doesn't become just a flash in the pan, um, but we have to be dedicated in the long haul so that when when people like you, when you are as, as young healthcare professionals, uh, when you become our leaders, that we are still dedicated to this issue. And then finally, determination. We have to have long-term commitment to change. This, this is not going to change overnight, but we have to be committed to the long haul. I'll leave you with a quote that I think is very important from activist, scholar, um, and leader, um, and writer, I think, James Baldwin. Um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. It is my hope that we continue to face the um, ugly ways that racism has impacted healthcare outcomes, but that we find ways we find ways to fix that. We find solutions to that. Um, and that ultimately I'm, I'm so inspired by you all. I, I wish you nothing but success and, and perseverance um, as you move towards your goals of being um, healthcare leaders because we need you to help us continue to face these issues. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your insight, Dr. Powell. Um, we can go ahead and start our Q&A. So um, if you would like to stop sharing your screen. Yes, great. thank Perfect. you. Okay, um, so we have a couple questions, so I'll just read them out. Um, our first question is, do you consider possible, do you consider possibly the fact that these medical researches um, made back on black people may be taking place again now to learn more about the human body against a person's will. Mm. So the question is, if I'm understanding it, do I think that, oh, I can see the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, you should be <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, do I think that it's possible um, that this could happen, this could be happening again? Um, I do think it's possible. I, I think that, I hope that it's not happening again, but I do think it's possible. Um, I think that because we have, not been as, um, I don't know, I think is we haven't had the hard conversations we need to have about racism in this country. Um, we, we have not um, really worked to overcome and change um, the future by kind of dealing with the past. I do think it's still possible. I think that our healthcare systems um, are not teaching about the ways that um, black bodies and not just black people, but um, the disability community, the LGBTQ plus community, uh, Native American communities who have also been exploited by science and healthcare. We're not teaching about that. So until we're actually making sure that that's a, a core part of the curriculum, that's a core responsibility um, for of learning that you have to have mastered these competencies to be healthcare professionals. Um, I think that this is this will be possible until until we really hold people accountable for their actions. Until we require that they show that they have mastered and understand the history, so that they don't repeat it. I do think it's possible, unfortunately. So, just to follow up on that. Um... Are there any classes in medical school that you know of that focus on things like ethics and race at a larger scale? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, it looks like Leslie, thanks for that question. Um, so I should say I'm not a medical doctor. Um, I did train at a medical school. So um, I have a lot of friends who are med students and a lot of friends who are doctors. But um, I think that there are some medical ethics courses. By and large, a lot of schools are starting to incorporate classes on the social determinants of health, which will kind of get at some of this, but not super precisely. Um, there are bioethics courses that may get closer to um, the opportunity to explore. And there are some medical ethics courses but I'm not sure that they are deeply um, 
uh, rooted in medical schools. I think medical anthropology might also be another lane to explore there. Um, but there are a lot of schools that are really trying to um, kind of, they're trying to find their way on how to include more of this information in their curricula. And I just firmly, I mean, honestly, I hope that this becomes a core requirement, um, understanding health equity and understanding social determinants of health. This has to be a core requirement for any um, pre-health student and for any future practicing healthcare provider. I completely agree. Um, another question we have is, Someone asked, as a white woman willing to be a physician, how can I contribute more to an equitable treatment of all patients that does not depend on race? Yeah, this is a great question. And I appreciate um, these questions rooted in, in allyship and really wanting to be a real ally. Um, I think I always start first with educating yourself. I think it's important to um, take the onus. Google is a powerful tool, right? There's so much you can learn there. There's a lot of factual history you can you can read about um, webinars, podcasts. I mean, videos. It just goes on and on. Documentaries. I would I would really encourage you to educate yourself first and foremost, um, and to not put the onus on people of color to help educate you. I think it's important to have intelligent conversations with um, with lots of different communities and people from lots of different communities, but don't put the onus on them to educate you on these challenges. Um, second, I would say. Um, you know, speaking up, speak up in, in classroom settings, speak up in, in private settings, and that's the hardest. Speak up um, in conversations with family and friends and um, really put this, this um, put racism and put oppression into context for people. Um, third, I would say, you know, find ways to learn from um, your patients and, and learn from, you know, those patients that you will come in contact with and recognize that that is a significant part of learning as well. Um, and finally, I just say, you know, remain open to, to knowing that you don't know everything. Um, I remain open to that as well. That's a commitment to cultural humility. That means that I recognize that I can never be competent in one culture, including my own, um, and that I constantly remain open to learning that what I thought may have been, you know, fact and truth um, may not actually be so and be open to, to new perspectives. That's amazing advice. Our next question is, um, what skills did you need to deal with racism in healthcare when you were studying um, for your PhD? Oh, this is a really, really good question. Thank you, uh, Rana, I think. Um, hopefully I said that right. My apologies if I didn't. Um, you know, I think there are several skills. Um, I think tenacity. So, you know, um, like being a graduate student of any kind, uh, being a pre, you know, dental student, a medical student, a, a PhD student, a master's student, being a student of any kind, you need tenacity, right, for the coursework and for all of that. But I think specifically as a Black woman, um, I needed tenacity to navigate everything else that came with being in uh, a largely white academic, uh, like, you know, setting. So um, I needed tenacity. I needed strategy. I, I think um, that is being strategic is really an underrated, like, skill. Um, and I think as people of color navigating um, academic systems that are, are largely um, like ivory tower-esque, you know, you have to be strategic about making contacts, about um, finding mentors, about finding support systems. Like I think strategy and being strategic about who, who my allies were and actually finding allies um, was, was really important. Um, and then I think I don't, I don't know, I think finding um, community, like finding community outside of just my program. I was the only black student in my program um, for four years. It's a very hard time to be the only black student anywhere. It was like 2012 through 2016. And so if you think about what was happening during that time, this was the genesis of the Black Lives Matter movement. This was the murder of Trayvon Martin, the murder of Michael Brown, uh, the murder of Freddie Gray. I mean, 
it's, it was, there were a lot of flashpoints that were just so significant in kind of the, the modern um, black liberation movement, if you will. And it was a hard time to be the only black student in a program. So I had to find community elsewhere. I had to find, um, I had to hold on to my friends and my family and people who, who knew me best in places where I could vent and just be honest about what I was feeling. But then I also, I, I think one other skill I'll add here is transparency. Like sometimes it's not always on, on us and I, I don't wanna put that on students of color, but sometimes there is an opportunity for you to just be, you know, um, very transparent in, and um, almost just raw about how, how things impact you. Um, because unfortunately, there are so many in our institutions just have, that just have no frame of reference. And so um, at points, if you are comfortable with that, if, if you feel emboldened to be transparent about the ways that racism have impacted you, which I very much was towards the end of my time in graduate school, um, I, I want to encourage you to know when you have the power to do that and know when to leverage that in a moment. But um, above all, I had to really embrace self-care because I could only be the leader that I am. I still have to embrace that now. I can only be the leader that I am when I have the energy and I have the mental capacity to do so. Thank you. And um, in your answer, you mentioned the Black Lives Matter movement. So have you felt that the BLM movement has reduced racism in healthcare at all, or do you think it's made no impact? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I think Black Lives Matter has elevated, um, it, it's, it's placed the impacts of racism on um, top of mind. It's made it top of mind in ways that um, I'm not sure any other movements in modern day really have. Um, the combination of social media, the combination of it being a hashtag but then growing into a decentralized movement is something that's very powerful. It's very unlike the civil rights movement, um, which, which was more centralized and was really had like very specific leaders, but Black Lives Matter is, is very different and um, it has provided a way for lots of people to plug in and lots of people who may not have plugged in if it were a centralized movement. So I do think it has definitely had an impact on healthcare, on healthcare institutions. Um, has it reduced racism in healthcare? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's been a case yet. I think it would take some time and some data to actually show us whether that's the case. But I think elevating this and making it a, a, a like household conversation. It's a tabletop conversation now with a very recognizable um, brand for better or for worse. And um, I think that that hopefully helps, you know, it helps keep this at the forefront of the conscience of America. And for that, I, I'm very grateful. And I do think it is having a strong impact on the nation and the world. Awesome. So the next question is um, for our attendees watching, do you have any books um, or reading recommendations off the top of your head to learn more about healthcare disparities in the past and present? Yeah, um, there are a couple. Um, most recently, there's a book, The Political Determinants of Health, um, which is by a colleague whose name just slipped my mind. Um, I'll come back to the title, but it's The Political Determinants of Health. It's really good. Um, there is a book that was written several years ago that's actually, um, I referenced in my dissertation to um, Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington, which really goes through the history of exploitation and experimentation on Black bodies and um, is a really important read. Um, there are a couple of, of books by Thomas Leviste on uh, race and ethnicity in healthcare that has like, it's like a big compilation of several different um, chapters. Um, Congresswoman Robin Kelly, who, who actually leads the Congressional Black Caucus um, Health Healthcare, I'm sorry, the Congressional Black Health Caucus Health Brain Trust, that's right. Um, she is a rep representative from Illinois, but she wrote the Kelly Report um, and it came out, I think, in maybe 2019. Um, the Kelly Report really is a modern day, very modern, probably the most modern day report we might have on 
um, health health inequities and the impacts of health inequities on the Black community. It's also a compilation um, chapters written by several of the nation's leading um, healthcare leaders and something else I would really encourage you to check out. Great. Our next question is a little bit more specific. Um, so someone asked, um, I'm an attorney who is transitioning to healthcare with an intent on focusing, uh, focusing on pain management. I want to run clinical trials and develop medicine and provide care for my experience with an undiagnosed pain condition that impended my life. I'm going to get a PharmD and MPH. Any suggestions for schools or programs with a focus on pain management? Wow, this is a really interesting question. Thanks, Jaconda. Um, and I, I love your story and thank you for sharing so much of it. Um, and I think this is also super important. Um, pain management is something that is never gonna go away, especially unfortunately, as we think about COVID-19, um, the people who um, survive COVID-19 often have a lot of, of things to manage, pain being one of them. Um, unfortunately, maybe for the rest of their lives, we're not quite sure yet, the data hasn't totally shown that, but um, certainly a field that is never gonna be out of, out of need um, and necessity. Um, I don't necessarily know any specific schools or programs, um, but I think that this will be an increasingly important area, um, especially as we think about the ways to um, manage pain, but also thinking about like the overprescription of pain medication, which really contributed greatly to the opioid crisis. Um, so I would think that there are several um, MPH schools or, or um schools of public health as well as medical schools um, who would offer some um, specific guidance on that. You may also think about if there are some fellowships. I know there usually are fellowships and additional training opportunities that are focused on specific kind of disease areas or specific skills. And I think pain management would be one of those. Perfect. Our next question is, what are your thoughts on pharmaceutical companies that aren't testing vaccines on minorities? Yeah, so um, I will also fully disclose that um, I work for a pharmaceutical company in my day job, but I'm, I'm representing the equitist here. Um, and, you know, I think that it's no secret that pharma and um, just the medical device industry altogether really have to do a better job of diversifying clinical trials that, um, that there are, there have been significant disparities. This is actually what I worked on for my dissertation. I went to graduate school to think about ways to increase the underrepresentation of minorities um, or to address the underrepresentation of, of minorities in clinical research. And so I've thought a lot about this. Um, you know, I don't think it's, it's right. I think that there is a lot of work, there's a lot of room for improvement on um, better um, including minorities and people of color in clinical research. I also think we could do a better job including women um, in lots of different segments of the population in clinical research. Um, but I also think, you know, again, this goes back to part of my presentation when I said, it's not just about mistrust on the side of the community that's been wronged. It's about creating trustworthiness and how do we create institutions, including pharmaceutical companies um, and medical device companies? How do we create institutions that are worthy of trust that have um, you know, longstanding relationships in communities um, and are ultimately invested in health equity beyond just participation in clinical trials? Um, so I think we have a lot of work to do there. Um, and I'm hopeful that, you know, with the leadership of many of you all who, have who are tuned in today in the future that we will get there. Great. So I also have another question um, for myself. So um, as you are a woman of color in um, the healthcare profession and science in general, have you ever felt imposter syndrome and how do you cope with that? Great question. Um, yes. I, I have dealt with imposter syndrome. I still do. I deal with it every day. Um, and for those who may not fully appreciate what imposter syndrome really is, um, it's any feeling that you don't belong. It's any feeling that you're underqualified, that, you know, why would people listen to me? Why should I be the speaker? Why should I be the, the student selected for this opportunity? It's just 
at the core of it, questioning your greatness is really what imposter syndrome is. Um, I, I do still deal with that. Um, and quite frankly, you know, I started the Equitist um, a little over a year and a half ago. So right when, right before COVID was declared an emergency, I started the Equitist. And since then, I have been really working on imposter syndrome because um, when you start, when you step out and really start to imagine your dreams through um, an entity you're building yourself, a lot of kind of deeply see, deeply seated kind of questions about your ability start to rise to the surface. And I've been actively working on that um, with some personal branding. Um, I have to actively tell myself some mantras and um, I challenge myself and I actually have to go back and look at the things that I have accomplished to remind myself um, that I am highly qualified to be where I am. Um, and I have worked very hard to be where I am, that nothing was, was handed to me. Um, and, uh, I worked really hard. So that's how I deal with it. I stay grounded. I stay, um, grounded in people who remind me who I am sometimes when I forget. Um, and I work on staying positive. Like I, it's easier said than done, but like, um, positivity and manifesting positive affirmations, are so important on this journey as pre-health students, um, you will face many barriers, many twists and turns. Um, Things may not all go according to plan, but um, try not to question your greatness and don't question how it all turns out because it will ultimately turn out just the way it's supposed to. Thank you so much. I know that that was definitely wonderful advice for all of our attendees watching. Um, uh, more specifically, what advice do you have for any students that are interested in spearheading their own health equity efforts? Yeah, this is great. Thanks for that question. Um, you know, I want to remind you, like, you don't have to be a medical doctor or a public health leader, or former state, you know, health official to champion health equity. Um, at the core of it, you know, we need equity in society to power us towards health equity. And I think there are several ways you can work on that, especially as pre-health students. Um, one, I think you can, you know, constantly think about um, in your in your discussions, in your classrooms, in your community endeavors, even as pre-health students, um, who are the communities who are not represented at the table when decisions are being made, um, when interventions are being discussed, who's not at the table and how do you find ways to, to flag that for people and make sure that those people are actually invited to the table. Um, so, you know, basically the mantra, like nothing about us without us, right? So think about the ways that decisions are being made about communities and the ways that you're talking about communities, even in your classrooms and, and call that out. Um, you have the power to do that. Students have so much more power than I think sometimes you even realize. Um, second, I would say, you know, challenge your studies, like challenge the things that you're learning in, in classrooms, um, bring additional material to your classrooms, bring, bring the things that are happening every day, current events that are happening every day to discussions in your classrooms and start to learn the communities that you are situated in, especially if you end up going to um, a school that is not within a community that you're from, learn the history of the community that you will be rooted in. It's so important. And I, I really hope that that becomes uh, a requirement in the future for all of our pre-health programs and for all of our um, you know, graduate medical degree and, and dentistry and all of those. Like It should be a requirement that you understand the history of the, um, the communities that you'll be serving. Um, and then finally, you know, this is going to sound like it doesn't relate, but it really does. So um, we often kind of underestimate the, um, the amount of influence that government and like policy and laws have on literally structuring health. So we talked about the social determinants of health, like a lot of that is decided by like government. So the last thing I'm gonna tell you to do is to please, please involve yourself in democracy. Please be a part of democracy, please vote. I can't tell you who to vote for. I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for, but I would really encourage you to be involved in active part um, of, of democracy, an active part of, of your community, an active part of making decisions about who will make the decisions 
um, about policies and laws that govern all of us. So that is has such a significant impact on health. Thank you so much. Um, we have one more question. So this is also from Jaconda. Um, when I grew up, we had black hospitals because of discrimination. Those hospitals were eventually closed due to integration, but is there an argument to be made for reopening black hospitals? Oh, this is, this is a dissertation long question, um, Jaconda. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you know, I think you could make the argument in, in several different ways. Um, on one hand, no, because um, we should be able to hold systems accountable for treating everyone equitably. On the other hand, we have seen that these systems are not capable of that. My concern would be in, in resegregating hospitals, my concern would be resource allocation because in, in the segregated hospitals never had the um, technology and never had the infrastructure and never had the funding that they really needed they took better care of their people, but they didn't have the resources they really needed to do it. So um, I'm actually not sure. I, I stand on both sides of the fence, depending on the day and, and the week. Um, sometimes I think that, um, you know, Black doctors could do a much better job of taking care of Black patients in uh, kind of in their own solitude. But I also know because of, of how this, this country is um, created and how these systems work, that somehow we would still be on kind of the, the losing end of the spectrum because of how resources are allocated. Like, you know, who would then do contract to do clinical trials in those sites and, and who would be their vendors and supply chain and like so much that goes into healthcare and healthcare is so much more complex than it was when our hospitals were segregated that I fear that Black patients would still lose out even even in a segregated circumstance because of how resources will be allocated. We are nearing the end of our time, but thank you so much for all your insight and the wonderful presentation, Dr. Powell. Um, for our attendees, we would love to hear your feedback from the session. So there will be a short anonymous poll that will go live soon. Um, other than that, be sure to be back in a few minutes for our next session with the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Powell. My pleasure. Thank you all. Bye.